Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started in about two minutes. Just want to give everybody enough time to go ahead and get locked in. Thank you for joining today. All right, well, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. How is everybody doing today? How is your Tuesday morning treating you so far? Hopefully not too bad. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? Just doing kind of a little audio check. Make sure everybody can see the screen all right. Yep, you guys are on mute. Yep, I can allow you guys to talk. Usually I just have to wait to see how many people show up because if we have 60 people, it's usually <laughs> a little bit challenging. But I think we're gonna have a pretty small group today. So if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself and chat, you certainly can. If you prefer the chat box, that's an option too. All right, well, great. My name is Shannon. I run the customer education program here at Concord. I actually think I recognize a couple of your names from some other webinars. So thank you for coming back. Today is our Concord contract manager. I don't encourage you trying to say that 10 times fast. It's very challenging. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about the contract life cycle stages. So I'm sure this is something that you are all very, very familiar with. You've probably been working with contracts for a very long time. But what we want to start doing is thinking about the different life cycle stages in terms of how they can relate to Concord. If Concord is your CLM, your contract life cycle management platform, then we have the unique opportunity to really use the platform for every single step. So that's something that people are usually pretty surprised by when I talk about Concord is that it really is a full lifecycle management platform. Start to finish, you can do it in Concord. Now, you don't have to do every step, but we're going to go through how to use every step within the platform. So that includes drafting the contract. So getting it started, uploading, starting from scratch, getting those internal approvals, negotiating dynamically with our customers and our third parties, our legally binding e-signature. We can securely store the document. Does anybody know the limits to the number of contracts that you can store within Concord? It might be too early for a bit of a trick question, so I'll just give this one to you guys. It's unlimited. Yeah, great. Someone just put that in the chat. You can store as many as you would like. So that includes contracts that you've executed within the platform, and that includes contracts that you've executed 
outside of the platform. You can upload them into Concord for storage. And then of course, with all of the documents that we have executed within Concord and uploaded into Concord, we can start reporting and analyzing so we can get a better feel for how all of our workflows are moving in terms of our contracts. So quick question for everybody, and you can just drop it in the chat box if you're comfortable. How long have you all been using Concord for? Excellent. So a couple of people are pretty new, a couple months, some folks here for about a year. That's great. You can probably give us some tips. Excellent. Well, some of you have been here for a little bit, so I'm sure you've noticed recently, actually last week, we had the big UI refresh. So we'll certainly be talking about all of that today as well. And one additional thing I want to mention is if any of you are admins, so you run your company account, your company settings, we will be talking about some admin managed functionalities, but most of this is going to be through the lens of somebody who's just managing contracts. If you do have admin based questions, certainly feel free to jump in, let me know. I can answer them quickly. We can talk about it afterwards, the session's over, or I can point you in the direction of some really great admin resources. That being said, this class is usually about an hour to an hour and a half, kind of dependent on questions, conversations we have. But I do encourage questions. I don't want it to feel like I'm just kind of talking at you for an hour. That's boring for anybody involved. <laughs> um, and also, I do encourage you to just jump in with questions in the chat, or I can, um, I think I've given everybody, let me just double check, permission to unmute. So if you prefer to ask audibly, feel free to do so. I promise you are not interrupting me whatsoever. Jump in. I am Boston born and raised. So I will just talk non-stop never come up for air unless somebody stops me so jump in at any time all right excuse me just one moment sorry unclear if it's a cold or allergies but it is winning so what we're going to start with is really just document building then working through the document and then analyzing and reporting so essentially every step of that contract life cycle management workflow and let's go ahead and just hop on over into Concord. And one other thing that I just want to mention here is that I am working off of an enterprise account. So if we talk about any of those features, I will, of course, make sure to call out that it is an enterprise feature. But if you are logged into your platform right now and you notice that ours might look a little bit different, that's why. You might be working on a standard account. You might be working on a pro account. It's just your organization has purchased whatever account is going to work best for your team. Everything that we are talking about today can be done on pro or higher. All right, so let's talk about actually drafting the contract. There are a couple of ways that we can go ahead and do this. When we go ahead and select draft and sign, we're going to see three options. We can create a blank document, we can upload a document, or we can start from a template. So one of the things I always stress is the importance of templates, because they are a blueprint document of a specific type for you. So if you are consistently sending out NDAs, it's going to be a giant pain to have to draft that contract from scratch every time you send it out. If you're on the sales team and you're consistently sending out sales agreements, having to add all of those fields, make sure the language is compliant, is also going to be a very large amount of your time. So what we have the opportunity to do is start from a template. I'll show you how to make templates, but I really like to stress at the very beginning how much faster it is to work from a template as opposed to drafting something from scratch. So let's say here that we are on the sales team. I'm about to make a sale. This is definitely fiction because I would be an absolutely terrible salesperson. But let's use this option here, sales contract. This is a template that had been pre-generated for me by an admin. 
I'm going to create the document. And as soon as it loads, we're going to notice all of the language is already built in. There are fields already built in. So I have the opportunity to really just set up signatories, share it out to third parties, and get started. I do not have to build it out from scratch. The other benefit to this is that when somebody updates a template, it gets pushed out. So if I were to start a template tomorrow that was updated last night, or tonight rather, sorry, I get my days a little bit mixed up there, all of those updates would be ready for me in that template. It won't affect any existing documents created from a template, but anyone using that template moving forward would have those updates. So if any sort of compliancy changes, if any additional language needs to be added into the document, templates is going to make that very accessible to your team. So again, we'll talk about making templates, but you can see very quickly that I can start a sales contract in about 30 seconds, as opposed to building it out from scratch. So if you've been shared to templates, certainly take advantage of them. If you are kind of starting or leading the charge of Concord within your organization, keep templates in the back of your head because it's going to make your team's lives just that much easier. Additionally, your legal team will thank you for it because it will make sure that all of the contracts that sent out have the appropriate language because it's one less thing that the individual user has to remember to add. So let's come back into draft and sign here and we can also create a blank document. This information exists in the contract summary. You can fill it out right out front right now or you can fill it out at any point throughout the contract's life. I'm gonna skip it for now. And when you start from scratch, that's exactly what you're doing. You are using Concord as a word processor to build your document. So you can type information in, you can edit the text, you can add images, you can add grids, you can go ahead and adjust the formatting to suit your needs. We can drag and drop in fields to collect information from invitees to the document. We have that full editing capability but we're building it out from zero and taking it to 100. The other option we would have in terms of drafting the contract is to upload a document. So this is probably a more common option. Folks have a tendency to like to build things out, in Microsoft Word, Google Docs, what have you, and then upload it. We accept Word documents and PDFs. So I'm gonna show you both options because they're a little bit different just in terms of the capabilities that you're going to have. So let's start here with a PDF. So of course we'll have to choose the PDF option and let's create that document. So it's gonna look very similar in terms of the menu options that we have, but in terms of editing capabilities, we're pretty limited. I can't add those tables. I can't add in those images. I can't come in here and edit the text because when we bring in a PDF, it's essentially bringing in an image of text. So being able to adjust that text is not something we're gonna be able to do. What we can do is add in fields, but the fields that we are able to add into the document are a little bit limited. We have our signature fields, and then we have our standard short answer field, which is a text field. So we don't have that much creativity in terms of the field options that we do with that live editor that you saw when I started from zero. So when we use that live editor, we can use paragraph fields, we can use radio buttons and check boxes. This is really restricted to signing fields and text fields. PDFs, if you are bringing in a PDF, this is a super helpful tool, especially if you're potentially maybe bringing in a contract that is third party paper. So you had a customer who said, this is the contract we need to use, end of discussion, it's a PDF, great, you can upload it. The other option, of course, would be a Word document. Now, when you bring in a Word document, you're gonna be presented with two options. Let's use commercial lease agreement. You can use Word mode and live document. So what is Word mode? Word mode is meant specifically for formatting. So we had a lot of customers come to us and say, we're building out these absolutely beautiful, perfect contracts in Microsoft Word. They have bullets, they have numbering, they have a font that is stylized to our brand. And when we upload it into Concord or any third party, really, we are noticing that the formatting is getting skewed and that's very frustrating. So using word mode is, in the most basic sense, translating your document to an image or a PDF so that way your formatting remains consistent. 
So your formatting will exist exactly as it does within Microsoft Word. So when we create this document here, the formatting will be retained, but the negotiation, that dynamic editing is going to be a bit limited. So similar to the PDF, we can do signer fields, we can do standard fields. The most common option and where we're going to be spending a good chunk of our time today is that live editor, because that's where we have that full functionality of adding fields. That's where we have that full functionality of editing with our third parties. So we're going to go ahead and upload a document. I'm going to browse and let's just use that same commercial lease agreement. And we're going to use that live document live editor. And we'll create. Perfect. Um, I saw somebody has their hand raised. Uh, if you want to jump in and talk at any point, you can if you have a question. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I have a question on the signature fields. Okay. Because I, I we are using the pro uh, account, and I'm not sure if it's an issue that I encounter as an admin or is an issue or the pro account. But when I set the signers, I can only uh, include uh, an email address. So I cannot feel like name, surname. So when the, the fields will be actually, actually the field uh, are, I mean, the signers is only uh, mentioned as an email address and not with by its, uh, his or, or name or surname. Gotcha. Yep. So we're actually going to talk about e-signature in just a bit here, but there are two options that you'd be able to use. One would be the preset signature field, which would collect their name. The second would be building out your own signature block and requesting that they add their full name. Um, so we're going to go through both of those mm -hmm. options. If you don't mind, if we just kind of put that question on hold for a quick sure. second, and then we can come back to it, if that's all right. All right. Perfect. Awesome. And then, sorry, did somebody else have a question? I kind of flashes on my screen. Just want to double check. All right, excellent. And again, please just feel free to jump in. I promise you are not interrupting me. I encourage questions. Again, I'll just keep talking. I'll talk all day. So if you have questions, just unmute yourself and go for it. I, you know what? I do have a quick question as of well. Of course. Good morning, everyone. So from the beginning where you said start from a template, I mm -hmm. tried to type in sales and I typed in some other words, but nothing, no results were found. So in that situation, would I save a like a document to my desktop and then upload it if I can find the research, well, the searches that I'm looking for? So if you don't have any templates, when you select start from a template, it just means that your team hasn't created any templates yet. So even when I search, because I know there's one saved, but I try to search and there's no options available. If you can't find the template when you run that search, it means you probably don't have access to the template or That's it wasn't was saved as a template. It might have been saved as a document. It might be in a different stage, but all of your templates would be available to you when starting from a template. That's what I was wondering if I had limited access. You might. Yeah, it might just be that somebody on your team has created a template and didn't share it to you or they just created a document and didn't save it as a template. So if I don't have access, then I guess the next best thing would be to upload a document. Yeah, you could upload a document. You could reach out to your admin to see if they could share that template out to you. And we're going to talk about creating templates ourselves as well. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. All right. So now that we have the document uploaded, there's probably some things that we're going to want to do to it before we actually start that negotiation process. And one of those things is, of course, going to be adding fields. So fields that are meant to be populated by internal users or fields that are meant to be populated by external users, information that is meant to be collected from a live person throughout this process. So when I come into edit mode here, I'm going to open up my fields and 
the first thing that we need to do is assign someone to the field. So we can assign an external guest, which means anyone shared to the document who has the permissions to edit, any internal user shared to the document who has the permissions to edit, or anyone, which means anyone shared to the document can fill out this field as long as they have the permissions to do so. So I'm going to assign a couple of fields to external guests. So this is information that I'm expecting to collect from the third party that I'm sharing this document to. And as I mentioned, we have standard fields. We have signer fields once someone has been assigned as a signatory. And then we have our smart fields. So a quick overview on smart fields. <clears throat> it's admin generated. Excuse me one second. Apologies. It's an admin generated feature and they are creating fields for you. So instead of having to build them out from scratch, you can just drag and drop them into your document. Additionally, they're dynamic. So let's say we are looking for our customers initials in a couple of different locations. Let me drag and drop the field in here. With a smart field, What's going to happen is as soon as our customer initials in one location, it's going to update in all of the customer initial smart fields. So they're dynamic in the sense that if there is a smart field that exists multiple times in the document, filling it out once will populate all of the other fields of the same name. So when you log in, you might not see all of these smart fields. These are smart fields that my admin has created because they think it's beneficial to our team you are going to see what your admin has generated for your team. So very simple for you to be able to just take that field, drag and drop it into the appropriate location. The other option we have, of course, is customizable fields. So if it doesn't exist as a smart field, maybe I am looking to create my own. So I'm going to drag and drop in short answer. And I'm going to drag and drop in short answer again. Now, the placeholder is going to remain short answer unless I decide to change it which I can do by clicking into that field and adjusting. So we're gonna say tenant name, fields by default are required. So that means somebody must complete this field before we are able to move forward with e-signature. If you wanna take the required off, you simply just toggle to off and then hit save. I'm also gonna change this short answer here and we're gonna add in landlord name. Now, what you might be curious about is why are these fields locked to me? Why am I seeing that little padlock icon? I am seeing that because these fields have been assigned to an external guest. I do not fall into that bucket, so I cannot complete these fields. So they're locked for me. I'm able to identify them and see that that is information that we are going to ultimately collect, but I am not allowed to complete it because I am not part of that assignment. Let's go ahead and add some fields that can be filled up by an internal user, which would be me or any of my colleagues added to the document. We'll bring in actual cost. And I'm kind of just dragging and dropping these anywhere quickly. And let's bring in, let's bring in today's date. All right, I'm gonna save that here. So we have some fields in for information that we need to collect. If we wanted to, we could come in and edit text. So if there was anything we needed to change before this gets sent out, we certainly could. Now, what I'd like to show you is once you have this commercial lease agreement in a really great place. So maybe that includes specific fields. Maybe we add an approval workflow, what have you. If you wanted to, you could save this as a template. So if we say, wow, this commercial lease agreement is exactly what we need every time a new commercial lease agreement is produced, I'm going to copy it as a template. But I'm also going to change the title because I want it to be very clear that it's a template. So what I'm going to do here is say commercial lease agreement. I'm going to add some placeholders for my team members. We're going to say customer name. And then we're going to say date. We're going to hit save. And we would share this template out to any of our users who are going to be executing commercial lease agreements. 
And then of course, what they'll be able to do is start from a template, start from a commercial lease agreement, and have to do a lot less work than we needed to because all of that information is already built in. A quick way for you to also be able to identify any templates that you have is if you come back to your homepage, right over on the right-hand side, there are these quick links to filters. So if you wanna see all templates you have access to, all of your documents that are signed you have access to, you can go ahead and take a look at those there. All right, so let's go back into this document here. Because I'd like to go ahead and use that template. Excellent. So we got the fields in that we need. There's still a bit of information that we're going to require as well. So let's go ahead and come back into edit mode. And what I'd like to take a look at next is our signatories. So these are the individuals that I expect to sign the document. So I'm going to add myself as a signatory by coming into the signer panel and selecting add signer. And then I'm also going to add my third party person, which is going to be Maxwell. Now, one thing you're going to notice is I'm adding Maxwell as a signatory, but I haven't shared him out to the document yet. And that is because maybe there's still a couple of edits that I want to make to the document before I give my third party access. So we've added Maxwell as a signatory, which means I can start adding fields and assigning them to that signatory specifically now that they have been authorized as a signatory. But they're going to be put in a holding pattern in terms of accessing the document until I decide to send them the invitation. So again, there might just be a couple of edits that I want to add to the document before I'm comfortable actually sharing out, making it public. So until I'm ready, they're going to wait here until I send that invitation. Now, this is actually going to come back to that question that was just asked. So when you are setting up your e-signature fields, you have two locations to do so. The first of which would be to use our preset signature block. So for those of you that have been using Concord for a bit, you're probably very familiar with this preset signature block. When you request the signature, it requires your third party to type in their name. They have the option to type in their company, and then they can sign. So this preset signature block is giving our e-signatures a location to exist. The new default functionality turns this off. You can still turn it on at any time, but by default, we don't have that preset signature block, which means when we request signatures, we're going to get an error message because there isn't a location for our signatories to e-sign. So if we choose to use our own signature block, what that means is we have to create that location for them to sign. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to open up my fields. I'm going to select myself as the signatory. And then you're going to see here that I can now add signing fields, which include full name, title, company, and signature. Now, when you're adding in fields to the document, sometimes the formatting can be pretty challenging. So if you want a clean, polished look to your configured signature block, what you can do is use a table. You don't have to, it's just a neat little trick if you do want it to seem a bit more organized or fit into a very specific location. So we're gonna add a table and I'm gonna do four by two. And let's just extend this a little bit. And now for this particular signature, we have to have a location for someone to sign. So that e-signature field is a must because that is where our signatories can execute the signature. The full name, title, and company are optional. Most people associate these fields when they are getting somebody's e-signature. So what Concord has done is add those fields so we don't have to continuously create them. So I wanna collect the full name, I wanna collect the title, and I wanna collect the company. Now, because we don't have that preset signature block, what is happening here is these fields are required. So since they are required and assigned to Shannon, myself, I am going to be, <coughs> sorry about that. I tried to get to the mute button, didn't make it quite in time. 
I am going to be required to fill out this information. So this is how I would be able to obtain their full name, their title, and their company information, should I need it. I'm going to do the same thing here for Maxwell. We're going to request their full name, title, and company, and we're going to get their signature. Now, again, because these fields are required, they have to fill it out before they can sign. So to go back to that question that was asked, you know, when I add a signature field, it's just a signature field. It's not asking me to get their name or their title or their company. So if you do want that information, that's when you can use those pre-configured signer fields and just drag and drop them into the appropriate location. The other option would be to use that preset signature block. Some people really like this, it's very easy. Others prefer to build out their own because they want it to be a bit more customizable. And then other times people are bringing or importing in third party paper, which often already has a signature block already built into the text. So what people don't want to end up with is that preset signature block that exists within the text and then the preset signature block down at the bottom. So they turn that off and use their own. Both options are legally binding. It really just comes down to how you want to structure your signatures. Does that kind of answer that question that you had about collecting the name and other information? Just want to kind of circle back on that because it was a great question. Yes, thank you very much. Awesome, perfect. And any other questions up to this point about bringing in the document, adding in the fields, assigning the fields, assigning the signatories? Just want to make sure everybody's comfortable so far. It's a lot of information. <laughs> all right, great. So now that we have all of these fields in the document, I'm ready to actually share this out to Maxwell. I want them to be able to come in, start making changes. So let's go ahead and send that invitation. Now, when someone is put into the holding pattern as Maxwell was, when we do send the invitation, they are automatically shared as a limited editor. So when you share the document out, you can give viewer permissions, which means they can't edit, they can only view. So great for awareness, perfect for if you don't need them to make any changes. Limited editor, it means they could come in and fill out specific fields. So Maxwell would be able to fill out any fields that were assigned to them. They would be able to fill out any fields that were assigned to an external user. Editor means they can edit the entire document. So if you do want someone to be able to negotiate, make changes, let's give them editor permission. And I'm actually going to share this out to one more person. I'm going to share it out to a colleague of mine. And we're going to give them full editor permissions as well. Because they've been working on this contract with me. So let's hit send. And we're done. So now that Maxwell has full editor permissions, what I want to mention here is that they could theoretically select edit and come in and add a lot of text. They could come in and delete text, which is great. We want them to be able to make changes. We want them to be comfortable and confident with where the contract is going to end up, but we might want a little bit more control over the changes that they're making. Now, very unlikely somebody would come in and make incredibly drastic changes, but it is helpful for us to be able to track what they are doing. So you have the opportunity here to come in to your revisions drop down and turn on track changes. I always suggest turning this on, maybe just because I'm a little bit of a control freak, but additionally, if you have a lot of people on a contract, we only have three, so it's pretty manageable. But if you have a lot of people making edits, it's gonna be pretty challenging to keep up with all of them. So with this track changes turned on, watch what happens when anyone makes an edit. If they delete something, if they add text, there's a visual indication here, great. Shannon Callahan has made an edit. As an internal collaborator, so this would be myself or Jennifer, we can come in and say, yes, we accept. No, we reject. Yes, we accept. 
So it gives us control over the edits that are actually fully adopted into the contract, but still allows our third parties to collaborate dynamically with us. The other option you have is every single time someone clicks save, internal or external, a new version is created. So let's say you forgot to turn on track changes and your third party just came in and went absolutely wild. You can of course, revert back to a previous version. So this is the last public version. This is our first version. So we've only hit save three times. We've only been working in the document for about a half hour. I can come back in here and say, all right, I wanna restore this version, this version, excuse me, or I'd like to export it so I can have it on my hard drive. And I can also make comparisons. So maybe I wanna compare this particular version with version one. So show me all of the changes that have been made from version 0.1 to version two. And it's going to highlight all of that text in this kind of bluish purpley color. So we have a really good understanding of what's taken place. Now, dynamically editing includes, of course, going into the document, doctoring it up, adding those fields, completing those fields. But additionally, we can add comments and we can use the discussion panel. So when you highlight text, you're going to see this little speech bubble icon over to the right hand side of the document, and you can add a comment. So very similar to kind of Microsoft Word, Google Docs, you have the opportunity to add a comment to specific line items, and we can choose the audience. So public means everybody shared to the document can view the comment. Internal means only internal individuals will be able to view it. So that would be myself and Jennifer. One thing that I always stress is that comments cannot be edited or deleted once posted, and you also can't change the audience. So when you are telling your team about commenting and telling your team about discussions, I always make the joke, just make sure that you wouldn't comment anything that you don't want your grandmother or your CEO to see because it cannot be taken away. Typically not gonna be something you worry about on a legal document, but that little joke really drives the point home. So let's add a comment here. We're going to say, you know, I thought we agreed upon 80K. You're going to have to pardon my typing. It's, it's just bad all the time. And I'm going to keep it public. We're going to hit comment. The comments are going to remain to the right-hand side until they're resolved. So somebody can come in and they can respond. And then once we've wrapped this up, we're going to go ahead and resolve it. Now, as I mentioned, resolving the comment doesn't get rid of it. It simply hides it. When you come into your audit trail, we have all of the important actions that have taken place within the document, but we also have the history of our comments. So even if we hide it, it's still visible. The audit trail is going to be visible to both you and your external individuals. So if you invite third parties in, they will be able to see the audit trail as well. If a comment is public, they'll be able to see it. If it was internal, it would be hidden from them. So you don't need to worry about that. The other option we have for collaboration is the discussion. So I like to think about comments as more line specific questions, thoughts, concerns. Discussions are more all encompassing. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, we're not highlighting a specific piece of text. And two, when you add a message to the discussion, it's going to send out an email to the audience. So if I make a public message, an email is going to be sent to myself, to Jennifer, and to Maxwell, letting them know that a new discussion piece has been added. So it really helps keep everybody on the same page. So discussions are going to be great for things to the effect of I really want to wrap this up by Friday. Please have all your edits done by end of day Wednesday. Information that is going to be pertinent to everybody on the document. Same functionality here with the audience. We have public, we have internal. Public is for everybody. Internal is only for internal colleagues shared to the document. One final piece that I would like to showcase for collaboration is your summary panel. Now the summary panel is going to be visible to internal team members. So it will be visible to myself and to Jennifer. 
It is incredibly powerful for internal collaboration because it gives us the opportunity to provide so much additional context to the document. So we can add the third party name, which is the Maxwell Inc. Maybe they are a, oh my goodness, typing is terrible. Maybe they're a you know granite company in Southern New Hampshire. If we want to add any tags to the document, this is where we could go ahead and do that. We can link out to other documents. And most importantly, we can set up the life cycle. So maybe this particular lease agreement is going to be valid for a period of one year. We've decided that it's going to become effective on the last day in May. If you'd like to add renewal periods, you can. All of this date-based information is going to be what drives your notifications moving forward. So if you want to start receiving notifications when it contract is set to expire, we're going to need to make sure we add that life cycle information. So you always want to make sure your team is filling out that contract summary, because six months from now, we probably won't remember every single detail about the Maxwell organization, but having it written here is going to be incredibly powerful, because it is going to exist in the contract summary as long as this contract exists in Concord. So if you don't delete it, it's always going to be there for you. Excellent. Any questions up to this point? Uh, can the same message be sent to multiple contracts at the same time? That is a great question. Uh, when you write information in the discussion panel, it is for that document specifically. So there wouldn't be a way to say like from the home page, select multiple documents and send a reminder all at once. Although that would be really cool and i will certainly pass that feedback on to our development team um, but currently the functionality exists a discussion in the document is for that document only yeah absolutely i'll pass that along i could certainly see that being very very helpful especially if you have a couple documents that are coming up on their renewals perfect all right, so we've drafted the contract. We've started the process of negotiation. We also have the opportunity to include internal approvals. So when you come over to your right hand panel, you're going to see this approvals option. And when you select set approval, you have two options, a company approval and a custom approval. So similar to the smart fields that we talked about earlier, those are admin generated. Our company approvals are admin generated as well. So instead of you having to build out a approval from scratch, you can use any of these pre-built approvals from your admins. So let's say here we have a sales agreement required for all sales. This is an event contract approval. What you're probably noticing is that a lot of these approvals have this caveat that, hey, this is required for all NDAs. This is needed for all consulting contracts. So that says to me as the creator of this document, hey, I better add this to my lease agreement. Now, can anybody think of a way that we could guarantee that a specific approval was in a document? Because this is required for every lease agreement. So what could I have done to make sure that when I started this document, it already existed? Any thoughts? We can add approvals to templates. So you'll remember when I was drafting that template, we were talking about how you can bring in fields, you can bring in approvals, you can bring in anything that you want carried over. If you wanted, when you're building out a template, you can add in that approval workflow, which will then be carried over to any document that is started from a template. If we wanted to go back and add this to the template, we absolutely could. We'd open up the template, we'd edit, we'd add it. So you do have that opportunity when you're creating templates to build it in, or we can come in here and add it ourselves. So these are pre-made approvals. So this is saying here we have one step and it's going to be approved by me. Super simple. The other option would be to create your own custom approval. So a custom approval is essentially, all right, it doesn't exist in the company approval, but I do still require approval from specific people within my company before I can move forward with this document. So I'm going to select custom approval. 
and we're going to add a step and you can do two things you can add a mandatory step or a conditional step a mandatory step simply means that no matter what happens on this document we need approval from a specific person or a specific team a conditional step is an if then statement so what that means is if something happens then we're going to require approval so it allows you to be a little bit more judicious about the number of approvals that you put through your ceo or you put through to your manager conditional steps are based off of smart fields so you'll remember i put in four separate smart fields into my document so let's build this conditional step off of the actual cost so we're going to say if the actual cost is greater than or equal to ten thousand then we need to get approval from jason and let's save so we don't have any approvals they're complete but let's go ahead and add information to the actual cost and we'll do 15k and now that this condition has been met watch what happens when we save our document now we have to request approval so we need to manually ask for that approval. So we're gonna select request and you can request with just the templated message or you can request with your own personal message. And now we're essentially waiting on Jason to approve the document before we can move forward with e-signature. If you are comfortable that your approval is not contingent upon information provided to you by a third party, there is an option to allow external guests to sign at any time. So that would mean Maxwell would be able to sign the document prior to retrieving this approval from an internal colleague. I'm gonna turn this off because Jason's actually a fake person. So we'd be waiting a very long time for that approval to come through. And I assume you all have other things you'd like to do today. So let's remove that for now. Because ease, excuse me, because approval workflows that have not been completed would bar you from requesting signature. So when we're ready to execute this document, we would not be able to do so until we have that approval. The second option that would bar us from requesting e signature would be any unresolved edits. So if somebody came in here and deleted this and we did not resolve that change we would not be able to request e-signature. So we're gonna go ahead and reject all these changes. Let's close out all the comments as well. And so, once we're comfortable with, oh, sorry, did somebody say something? I'm sorry about that, quick question. Of course. With the changes, would all of the editors need to approve it before you can move forward? Just one, just one just internal one. person. Okay, so we have three editors and one approve it, that's more than enough to go to move forward? Yes. Um, sorry, I think I might be misunderstanding what you're asking. Do you mind just asking so I, one more time? So I, I know when you drafted it um, before, you gave, I think, three people editing options. Uh huh. So if you give three people editing options and one person make changes, would the other two people that have the editing option, would they need to approve it before you're able to move forward? Understood. Nope, only one person would need to approve that change. So when we make changes here, internal collaborators can approve or decline them. So myself or Jennifer would be able to come in and say accept or reject. And once one internal collaborator approves or declines, you're able to move forward. You wouldn't need okay, to only one that is needed from all three individuals. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions? Or anything that I can explain a bit better? All right, great. So once we have this document where we're comfortable with it, that's when we can go ahead and start requesting our e-signatures from our signatories. Now, for those of you that have been using Concord for quite a bit, you're probably wondering, how am I going to be able to request signatures with blank fields? Because these fields, we have that little asterisk next to them, so they are required. 
how can I request signatures with empty fields? This is actually a new feature enhancement. So you are able to request signatures with required fields that are empty. But there are a couple of stipulations because if a field is required, it is required for a reason. You need that information. So you will still be able to get that information. The workflow is just going to be a little bit different. So let's go through that. I'm going to go ahead and request these signatures. And it's going to say, OK, you're going to request a signature from Shannon and Maxwell. Perfect. Send those requests. Up at the very top left hand corner, there are six fields that I can complete. I have to complete those six fields before I can sign the document. So what this really is just doing is giving each signatory a little bit more authority over their own time. So what I have the opportunity to do is fill out all the fields that are required of me and then I can sign. Whereas the functionality previously required me to fill out all of my fields, wait for Maxwell to fill out all of his fields, wait for person X to fill out all of their fields, and then we could request signatures. So it would take a bit more time for me to get to that point where I can sign. Whereas here, if I can fill out my fields, I'm comfortable with where the document is at, I can sign it. I don't have to sign it right away. If I wanted to wait until I saw the information that Maxwell put through, I can. But if my signature is not contingent upon the date or Maxwell's full name, then I can certainly sign and be done with it. So we have this field option here, which takes us through all of the fields that I am capable of filling out. Fields that I am not capable of filling out would be locked. So all of those fields that are assigned to Maxwell are going to be locked. So let's grab my full name. Let's grab my title. And let's grab my company. And I'm able to now sign the document, but it does say that there is still one additional field that I can complete. So why is that? That is because you'll remember when we first started adding fields to the document, I assigned fields to external members, and then I assigned a couple of fields to internal team members. So because it was assigned to a bucket of people instead of me specifically, I have the opportunity to either fill that out or I can wait. Because there are multiple people on this document that fall into the internal team member. So I can be responsible for filling it out or we can go ahead and leave it for Jason or Jennifer because they're both internal colleagues. So if I have that information, I can put it through. If I want to leave it for another internal team member, I have the opportunity to do so. So let's go ahead and sign that document. And it's going to let you know. So if you're wondering, well, why is it five out of six? It's going to here say, well, any internal user can add today's date. So that could be me. That could be Jennifer. That could be Jason. The other empty fields are all assigned to any external guests, so that means I can't fill that out. So we're going to go ahead and continue to sign. We sign the document. We're good to go. So now all I am doing is waiting for Maxwell to go through his fields and sign that information. Now, additionally, if I wanted to, I could come back in and fill out that internal field, even post signature, because we're assuming that if I sign the document and I am filling out this field, we're comfortable with the information that I myself am putting in. Or we could wait for Jason and Jennifer to complete it. Now, if nobody were to complete that any one field, that, excuse me, any internal user field, what do we think would happen? I've already signed the document. The only person to now sign the document left is Maxwell. So those fields would remain open until they were completed, and Maxwell wouldn't be able to sign until they were completed. So even though they're not his responsibility, we still can't execute the agreement until we have that information. 
So very important to remember that if a field is marked required, you are going to get that information. A lot of people requested this because it expedites the process of the signature, but also we had people saying we want people to be able to complete the date of signature after they sign and they weren't able to do that with the previous functionality. So this allows people to really work at their own pace, fill out their own fields and manage their own processes within the document. Any questions about that? I know it's a little bit different than how it existed. And I know a couple of you have been using Conquer for quite some time. So just kind of probably am over explaining this, but like to double check. Awesome. So one final thing I want to bring up is let's say that Jennifer and Jason didn't exist on this document. So it was just myself and Maxwell. What would have happened to those any internal user fields? Because I'm the only internal user, so I can't leave it to Jennifer or Jason. What would happen is I would then be required to complete those fields prior to signature because I'm the only internal user on the document. So it wouldn't let me sign until I filled it out. All right, so we have drafted, we have gotten internal approval, we have negotiated, we have e-signed the document. Any questions about those first four steps? All right. So Maxwell, of course, is not a real person. So what I'm going to do is finalize the signing. When you finalize the signing, it removes any unsigned signatories, any fields assigned to that signatory. Very, very rare that you would need to do this. I am simply doing it for the purpose of this demo because there's a bit of information I'd like to show you. So the document's been finalized. Once a document is fully executed, you can export the signature certificate. Now your e-signature is legally binding. Downloading a PDF of that document is legally binding. Proof that it is legally binding. But if you need a little bit of extra information in terms of the compliancy of our e-signature process, you can download this as well. And it's going to show you the audit trail, the number of signature fields, the IP addresses that individuals signed the document from. So additional compliance information should you need it. Yeah, of course. Let me show you that one more time. So once a document is fully executed, you can go to export and then download signature certificate. And then it's gonna download as a PDF right on your desktop. You can open it up, download it, print it, whatever you'd like. Yeah, of course. And one really interesting fact about the signature certificate, um, especially for those of you who have been using Concord for some time, it is available to any document that was signed in Concord. So if you signed a document two years ago in Concord, you can pull this up. As long as it was executed in the platform, you can populate this, uh, excuse me, you can produce this signature certificate. So any document that you create in Concord is of course going to be stored in Concord, but we had also mentioned that it's an unlimited document repository. So why not take advantage of that? You can store and track documents. So let's say that I just started using Concord last week, but I have this sales contract that was executed a month ago. So it's still active, but I signed it outside of Concord. I can bring the document into Concord. I'm not gonna be able to edit it because it's been added post signature. So we can't make changes post signature. But what I can do is take advantage of all of Concord's functionality. So we said this was signed about a week ago and it's valid for a period of one year. Let's say that it became effective when we signed it. And let's add a renewal notification of non-renewal. So now, even though I didn't sign this document in Concord, I'm still going to be reminded about its deadline. 
and it's going to become searchable for me. So I can search for titles, I can search for third parties. Additionally, all of your contracts existing in one place is going to be very helpful to have that single source of truth. So if you have the opportunity to upload documents that were signed outside of Concord, would seriously suggest doing so. All right, the last option that we have here, whoops, sorry about that, is reporting. So we want to be able to report and analyze over all of the contracts that we've either created, executed, or uploaded into Concord. So I'm going to go to my reports option, and let's create a report. So I'm going to say this is, you know, documents signed within the last 30 days. And we're going to come over to filters and I'm going to say show me all of my signed documents and we're going to say that we're signed. And we're going to say within the last 30 days. Now I might not have that many documents simply just because I clean my demo account out pretty regularly, but you can see here that we had quite a few that were signed within the last 30 days that gives me a pretty good overview of how my team is doing. And if I'd like to, I can export this. So you can export it to an Excel document. And it might take a few minutes. Maybe it'll go a little bit faster. We were having some problems with the demo accounts and the reports downloading, so might not happen. But it's going to give you an Excel document with every line item information. So it's gonna show you the title of the contract, when it was signed, who it was signed with. All of this additional information is going to be included. So you might have executives or stakeholders that wanna be able to understand how your contracts are doing, but maybe they don't wanna be shared to the contracts within Concord. Exporting your reports is a great way to provide that information to them without having to share them to the platform directly. All right, we have drafted, we have negotiated, we have approved, we have signed, we have stored, and we have reported. So we've gone through the entire life cycle in Concord. Any questions whatsoever? I've been talking at you guys for an hour now, so I'd love to hand it over to you and answer any questions that you might have. Hi, uh, um, I have a question, please. Of and course. I don't know if, if this is covered in this training or maybe another training. Um, my question is in two parts. First part, if we're creating a contract or, or a template, or maybe we were sent a contract and we just wanted to send it for internal review before we sign it, that's my first question. My second question is um, basically just when we receive the signed agreement, or a contract, just upload it in the proper folder um, and how to tag it or sign it. And, and again, I don't know if this is included in this training or another training, so apologies if I'm... Um, no, no. So uh, the first question, you want to just be able to review a document with colleagues? Correct. Uh, basically, we receive an, a contract from a third party. We want to mm -hmm. run it by our team or legal, get their feedback on it, and then if it approved, then we send it back, we sign it and send it back. Got it. Yeah. So you would want to upload that contract. So just uploading a new one really quickly. So we can kind of walk through this here. And then you could share it out to your team members. So depending on what you would like them to be able to do to the contract you can give them editor access you can give them viewer access you can also let's say we have to review this with jason we can include a personal message so i might say you know please take a look at this you know any thoughts you have add them to the discussion panel and then you'd all be able to review this together based on who was shared to the document. And then if you wanted to sign it and send it back, you could add yourself or whomever is expected to be a signatory on the document, sign the document, and then share it with the third party. Um, I'm not sure if 
that is what you are looking to do, please correct me if this is not in line with what you were looking for. Um, it, it is, uh, the second part is definitely is the first part is just for, for review and comments. Um, so when I assign it to, let's say our legal team, would they receive a notification that, Hey, this needs to be reviewed. And when they're done, do I need to receive a notification back, um, uh, that this has been done and, and reviewed and here are the comments, if any, or, or if it was approved and it just like it, it's tagged as an approved document to, to get signed. You could probably instead take advantage of approvals and assign the approval to your legal team. So we could say, let's see here, I'm just going to use my sales team because I don't have a legal team here. So pretend this is your legal team. And then you can request their approval. They'll come into the document, they'll be able to look at it, they'll be able to make their comments, add discussion panels. And then once it is approved, you would be notified. Perfect. So if you were concerned about receiving that email notification, when you come into your personal settings, you can choose how you would like to be notified about specific items. So you can say, I want an individual email anytime an approval is made to a document. So then you know you can come in and take those next steps. Perfect. I think this, this answers my question. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, one thing you're just going to want to make sure to do, I'm not sure if you're an admin um, or if a colleague of yours is an admin, is just make sure that they create teams. So they can create a team with your full legal team, and then that approval can be assigned to the team as opposed to an individual. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not an admin, but it's, it's a great uh, thing to have. And uh, I'm not sure that I know where I can find my preferences on my page. Yeah, no problem. So if you come back to your home page mm -hmm. and then oh. all the way down at the bottom, there's that little gear icon, click that and then yes. select settings. I see it now. Perfect. Yep. And then preferences. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, and then somebody asked a question in the chat. They said, is it possible to remove a signature field for an additional user after a contract has been executed? Once a document is fully executed, we cannot make any additional edits because it has been finalized. Um, my question for your question is, would you want to remove an empty signature field or a completed signature field? Because if you had an empty signature field, the document would not be fully executed. Um, so you, of course, could remove it because it wouldn't be fully completed. Um, an empty signature field, got it. You will not be able to consider a document executed if there is an empty signature field. So you could remove it because you would still be able to, to be in that editing mode or editing phase of the document because once it's signed, then it's executed. There are two signature fields for one provider. Yep, once you sign one field, they're both populated. Uh, in my case, one was signed and it was considered executed. Um, I am, I'm not sure that shouldn't be the case. Um, I can't really identify it without seeing it. You might want to open up a support ticket for that. They'll be able to kind of take a little bit more of a closer look um, and view your documents and such. But typically the way that it works is it, if a signature is assigned to a specific person, even if that is assigned multiple fields, once one of them is completed, they would all be completed. So the only thing that I can think of is that potentially one was a signature field and maybe one was a custom field that was just labeled as signature. Um, but that would be the 
only option that would make sense. Um, if you do absolutely have to go back and make edits to a signed document, you can cancel all signatures if it was executed within Concord. So let me find one that was. Sorry, just kind of look through to find the right one here. All right. You can cancel signatures um, as long as it hasn't been finalized. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely open a support ticket because it sounds like maybe there have been multiple fields that have been used within your document. I'm, I'm not 100% sure without seeing it. Sorry. Any other questions? Anything I can review? Anything that didn't make sense that we talked about? Um, I just thought of another question. When we are creating these documents for review, uh, for internal review before being sent to signature, um, can we include them in their folders first or are they being held in like a generic holding area before they get executed and saved into their own folders? Um, when you are building your document, the default location for your documents is going to be uh, your personal folder. You can come in and move it to a folder that you have access to at any time. So for this particular document here, if I wanted to move it into finance, I would say I am moving it from my personal folder into the finance folder. And then once this document became executed, it would be available to everybody else that had been shared to that folder as well. Okay, but if it's shared before we move it, um, does this remove any access that we've already given? If you are moving it from one folder to another folder, so if I was moving it, let's say from finance to HR, it could take away permissions. If you share the document directly to individuals, those individuals will have access to the document indefinitely. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, great question. All righty. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. It was great to work with you today. Thank you for trusting me with a good chunk of your time during the work day. I know that's really challenging to, to give up. So thanks for being here. Um, hopefully I'll see you in future webinars and I hope you all have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Bye everybody.